Aviation was very much in its infancy. Planes were rickety little contraptions, mostly made of wood and canvas. And there was a period of intense trial and error as both sides tried to perfect their flying machines. It's no wonder the early pilots had a very high mortality rate Ooh. as they adjusted to this new frontier in warfare. Very but high mortality there was one rate. man who took to the clouds like a duck to water. A man so good at what he did that he even won the admiration of his enemies that he shot out of the air. He was born a soldier from the horseback to the skies, and that is where the legend will arise. Captain Manfred von Richthofen, better known as the Red Baron. His father and several other relatives were all soldiers, and the young Manfred went on to receive an upbringing that would prime him for following in their footsteps. Despite being posh, Richtofen enjoyed a pretty standard country boy upbringing full of sports, horse riding, and hunting. He was particularly proficient in the last of these, and he became a skilled marksman at an early age. In true Chosen One fashion, it seemed like Richtofen's entire life was leading up to his iconic deeds, as he went into military school at the behest of his father at the age of 11. However, he didn't really want to go to military school, and he didn't enjoy his time there very much as he wasn't a fan of the strict discipline of the place. But he managed to get by with his talent for sports, such as football and gymnastics. So he did what every high school jock does, and coasted through the academic stuff, doing just well enough to scrape a pass at the end. With a background like this, it was only inevitable that Richtofen would be commissioned as an officer in the 1st Uhlan Cavalry Regiment of the Prussian Army. Richtofen was very excited about his fledgling military career at this point, as he thought it was, and I quote, the finest thing for a soldier to be, a cavalryman. When World War I broke out, Richtofen served on both the Eastern and Western fronts and greatly looked forward to getting his fair share of glorious charges and forging a knight's tale of his own, similar to those that captivated the childhoods of noble Germans like himself. And for a while, things went really well. Richtofen certainly seemed to be heading in this direction, as he was awarded with the Iron Cross for his bravery under Russian fire. However, fate had other ideas. The fighting eventually came to a stalemate, and Richtofen's role in the war was reduced to supply running with the Quartermaster Corps, instead of doing any actual fighting. Not only because cavalry aren't very useful in the trenches, and they did pretty much get phased out after World War I, but also because the Eastern Front wasn't really the main source of action. Richtofen quickly found himself extremely bored. He was desperate to do some cool shit, and he had not, to quote the man himself, gone to war in order to collect cheese and eggs. But, since he was benched, his dreams of heroism atop his steed appear to have been crushed. But before long, Richtofen found himself drawn to the skies, and increasingly desperate to escape from the humdrum existence of his cavalry regiment. So, he took some initiative and wrote a transfer application for the Imperial German Air Force, known as the Luftstreitskrafte. Yeah, fuck. This errand boy bullshit. You, you see the new sky horse? I want one. That's because that's how Germans sound. In His May accent's of really good. Fifteen. Richtofen's transfer application was accepted, and he began an observer flight training program. However, his first flight wasn't all it was cracked up to be. 
as he put it himself, I sat in an aeroplane for the first time. A blast of wind from the propeller disturbed me greatly. Everything flew away from me. My flying jacket slipped off, my muffler was too loose. In short, I was miserable. <laughs> Nevertheless, Richtofen persisted, and that June he served as a backseat aerial observer in a reconnaissance plane in Russia, which sounds very boring for someone who would become the Red Baron. But as 1915 went on, warfare in the skies suddenly became very exciting. In the early stages of the war, the only weapons on board the planes were the pilot's service revolvers, because the planes were just for reconnaissance. But naturally, the soldiers in the planes almost immediately started shooting at each other. And it wasn't long before the British pilot Lionel Hawker said, fuck it, and slapped a Lewis gun on his plane, shooting down two German planes and seriously damaging a third. However, adding such a heavy piece of equipment has a big effect on the manoeuvrability of such delicate planes, and also the gun itself was very hard to aim. But the Allies and the Germans wanted to shoot at each other so much that they couldn't help but try to make it work. Race. The boffins from both sides quickly determined that the best way to shoot from a plane was straightforward, so that the pilots could aim through their sights and steer at the same time. But this presented another problem. The pilots were just shooting holes in their own propellers. So to prevent this, French engineers added metal wedges to the backs of the propeller blades to redirect any bullets that hit them. Although these wedges would just very often deflect the bullet right back at the pilot. Typical French, even their bullets ran away from the enemy. But while this was effective enough that the first flying ace was a French pilot, the Germans were not to be outdone. If there is one thing that the Germans are good at, it's engineering. Not so much winning wars, but engineering nonetheless. And after they got their hands on a captured French plane, the Jerrys were on a roll. It only took them a few days to invent a timing device that completely solved the propeller issue by only allowing the gun to fire when the bullet would pass between the propeller blades so that it wouldn't hit them. And not long after this, the Fokker Eindeckers, or as I like to call them, the Flying Fokkers, were created that autumn, and they absolutely dominated the Allies in the air, in a period that became known as the Fokker Scourge. Mega. German is such a beautiful language. And it was at this time that the new planes and the aces flying them caught Richtofen's attention. Richtofen's admiration for the fighter pilots only increased over time, until it reached a fever pitch on the 1st of October 1915, when he had a chance meeting with the deadliest of all the German flying aces, a man called Oswald Bolke. This meeting changed Richtofen's life forever. He was inspired to pursue his destiny. Richtofen was going to become a fighter pilot. Richtofen wasted no time and learned how to fly under the tutelage of George Zimmer. Zimmer. Must have had a fast plane. Anyway, Richtofen no. learned very quickly and he actually managed to destroy a plane on his first solo flight. His own. He crashed. Richtofen's flying career had a bit of a turbulent start, but it didn't get much better for a while, as he also failed his first flying exam. Apparently, Japanese tactics didn't impress the Germans very much. Nevertheless, through practice and determination, Richtofen eventually managed to get good and finally pass the exam on Christmas Day of 1915. 
although the flying colours would come later. And from here, his career began to take off. Oswald Boke was impressed by Richthofen's tenacity <coughs> and decided to take the rookie pilot <coughs> under his wing. So he invited Richthofen to his new fighter squadron, Jagstaffel 2, or Yasta 2 for short, where he flew alongside Bolke and learned as much from him as he could. Richthofen then allegedly brought down a French plane, but it couldn't be confirmed because the plane went down behind Allied lines. However, it wasn't long before Richthofen finally got his name on the scoreboard. On the 17th of September 1916, Bolke spotted an enemy squadron and Yasta 2 flew into action following their commander's lead. Richthofen then took the initiative in pursuing a nearby British plane and they briefly exchanged fire to no avail. Richthofen then manoeuvred behind his opponent and, after a few twists and turns, he fired a short burst with his machine gun and was absolutely thrilled when his enemy's propeller stopped turning. Richthofen what? had just achieved his first confirmed victory and to mark the occasion, Richthofen placed a stone on his enemy's grave as a tribute and for himself, he commissioned a silver cup from a jeweller in Berlin which was engraved with the date and type of aircraft that he shot down. He went on to have a cup made in this fashion for every victory that he had, the number of which piled up very quickly at time at all before Richthofen had achieved the five aerial victories required to be considered a flying ace. Richthofen was having a great time in Yasta 2 as he flew alongside his squad mates and cute little dog mascot. And thanks to Bolka, his prowess as a pilot increased greatly. That's what's up. But unfortunately, all good things must come to an end. No, they don't. On the 28th of October, tragedy struck the squadron. They were Did he do cocaine? Did he snort cocaine out of a hooker's anus? Not that I have, but I'm asking, has he done that? Dude, you never know. They're engaged against two British planes, outnumbering them three to one. Great odds, especially with the superior planes and the leadership of Bolke. However, while Bolke was chasing down a British plane alongside his squad mate, a man named Erwin Baum, the wing of his plane brushed against the undercarriage of Baum's plane. Now, that doesn't sound like a major collision, does it? Well, they were going so fast that the impact tore the fabric off of Bolke's wing, which sent his plane crashing to the ground. And because Bolke wasn't wearing a crash helmet or his seat belt, he didn't survive the crash. After 40 victories, the top scoring German ace of the time and Richthofen's mentor met his demise. Not in a blaze of glory, but because he touched tips without using protection. Bolke's death devastated pretty much everyone that knew him, especially Richthofen, who sort of avenged his fallen mentor two months later by shooting down the man that he was chasing before he died. Bolke Damn. was so well liked that even the British paid their respects and honoured him with a wreath. With his Damn. mentor gone, Richthofen found his job getting harder because as aerial warfare grew even more popular, there were more planes in the sky than ever to worry about. However, this also meant that there were plenty of enemies for Richthofen to shoot down. And shoot them down he did. On the 23rd of November 1916, Richthofen was just casually flying around at a low altitude when he spotted three British planes above him looking for a fight. And naturally, he obliged them. He waited until one of the pilots tried to drop on him and then he sprung into action, swerving out of the way of the bullets of the enemy trying to come down behind him. 
as the two planes circled around each other relentlessly, Richtofen realised that he was fighting no ordinary opponent. This guy was a pro. As the dogfight continued, the two planes spiralled around each other with tighter and tighter evasive manoeuvres. But despite being equally matched in sheer skill, Richtofen maintained a slight edge thanks to his superior plane. It eventually became clear that the British pilot would have to bow out as he was only half a mile away from the German front and the wind was not on his side. It also didn't help that he was running low on fuel. So after quickly assessing his options, the cheeky bastard waved at Richtofen and just started heading home. The British pilot just went, well, it's been fun, but I'm leaving now, and, and left, uh, looping and diving as he did so. But Richtofen was not letting him get away that easily. The two pilots were so skilled that neither one had done any shooting, but now it was a duel to the death. Now, you said neither one of them had done any shooting. They have toilets on those planes? Where? But... Now it was a duel to the death. The British pilot zigzagged trying to avoid Richtofen's machine gun fire as he gave chase behind him. The two planes kept dropping altitude and Richtofen's machine gun fire was relentless. The British pilot dodged like there was no tomorrow and Richtofen's gun jammed. Damn! It was Damn. too late. The Damn. British plane went down 150 feet behind German lines and the pilot had been shot in the head by Richtofen's last burst. Damn. And it quickly became clear why Richtofen's opponent was so skilled. He was no ordinary pilot. It turned out that Richtofen had just shot down the legendary British ace Major Lano Hawker himself. Richtofen was very proud when he found out that he had shot down who he called the British Bulky and secured his 11th kill in the process. Damn! And Hawker's machine gun made an excellent addition to Richtofen's collection, which he Damn. mounted above the entrance to his quarters. That's fine. But Richtofen also greatly admired and respected Hawker's bravery and skill as a pilot. So he was glad to know that German grenadiers gave this worthy opponent a proper burial. In fact, Richtofen took honour very, very seriously, which was a common trait among German pilots. The Luftstreitskraft was shooting. much more chivalrous. Oh, I swear to God, I thought he said shitting, John Ross. I was like, yo, this nigga's shitting his hand and I got him. Gah, mother ah, that would actually be pretty impressive. ...than other ah. military units of the time, which led to them often being called the Knights of the Air. And their respect for their ah. enemies didn't just lead to nice burials. While flying behind enemy lines, some German pilots would even drop bundles of letters from captured airmen or personal possessions of those that had been killed for the British to send home. Richtofen heralded the new year with his 16th victory. So 1917 kicked off with his performance beginning to receive the recognition that it deserved. After all, Bolke had received the Ordre pour le Merite, which is a bit like a British OBE after only eight kills. And Richtofen had just doubled that making him the top living scorer of the war. But where was his shiny medal? Well, it wasn't long before the telegram came, announcing that Richtofen was being given command of his own squadron, Yasta 11. However, Richtofen was not happy about this. Not just because he had to say goodbye to his Yasta 2 buddies and get to know a bunch of new people, but because he actually really, really did want that shiny medal. Luckily, 
he didn't have to wait too long because he was overjoyed to receive another telegram a couple of days later telling him, yes, you have won the shiny medal. To celebrate his promotion, Richthofen painted his albatross biplane bright crimson, which earned him his iconic nickname, the Red Baron. And you can really see the bright red, you know, really coming through on this fucking black and white photograph. But it wasn't just his own plane that the Red Baron was painting red. April of 1917 is infamous for being the Royal Flying Corps' worst month in the entire war because the Luftreitskraft fucked them up beyond all recognition in what became known as Bloody April. The British planes were so outclassed that their losses were four times worse than the Germans, which dropped the life expectancy of British pilots from 295 hours to just 92 hours. Damn. Many rookies were lucky to survive beyond just two days. And the Red Baron made those two days absolutely hellish with good old-fashioned German efficiency and superior engineering, as he and the rest of Yasta 11 were responsible for 89 out of the 298 kills by German aircraft, of which 21 were shot down by the Red Baron himself. And to top it all off, the Red Baron ended the month in spectacular fashion by taking down four British planes in a single day, which brought his victory tally up to 52. At this point, he was untouchable, the undisputed top dog of the Luftstreitskrafter. To any Germans watching, I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, and... No, I'm not going to try. The Red Baron was so deadly throughout the first few months of his squadron's existence that it's no wonder that he was the perfect candidate to take on some more responsibility. Despite the Germans having better planes and more skilled pilots, Yasters were always outnumbered by the British squadrons, which was problematic in dogfights because they were normally fought one-on-one. -on -one. To compensate, multiple Yastas often flew together unofficially in larger units because, you know, safety in numbers. Therefore, Richthofen was promoted again when Yasta 11 was officially merged with Yastas 4, 6 and 10 into Jagdeschwader 1, which Richthofen was the leader of. This unit was nicknamed Richthofen's Flying Circus because... The Red Baron's men copied him and painted their planes in all sorts of bright colours. They also moved around like a travelling circus, using tents and improvised airfields that were packed up and moved around by train as the unit was constantly reassigned to wherever the British needed a thoroughly good arse kicking. And they really did kick arses. They were so good that 20 members of Yasta 11 alone were flying aces, including the Red Baron's brother, Lothar, who was a Damn. very impressive pilot in his own right. The Red Baron's larger-than-life image and massive success caught the attention of the German government, who used him as fuel for their propaganda machine, telling the public of his gallant deeds and using him as the poster boy of the German war effort so that they could sell war bonds. As a result, the Red Baron very quickly became Germany's biggest hero and was idolised so much that soldiers would carry pictures of him in their pockets. In fact, the Red Baron was so valuable that Ludendorff said that he, and I quote, was worth as much to us as three divisions. But Damn. the question on the mind of every British pilot that wanted to take the Red Baron down was how? What was the secret of the Red Baron's success? After all, you know how ridiculously easy it was to die in a plane crash back then? And 
even the most skilled pilots weren't immune to shitty luck. So, how did the Red Baron manage to win so many battles? You all know that the main goal of dogfighting is to get behind your opponent so that you can get a clean shot at them without them being able to shoot back. And while doing so, you dodge, duck, dip, dive, and dodge. And mm -hmm. generally do whatever you can to keep your enemy off your own tail, which looks like a very impressive display of acrobatics on the ground as two noble knights of the air duel to the death, with the victor emerging through superior skill and courage. Well, in terms of flying skill, the Red Baron was actually pretty average, because he had put all of his skill points in marksmanship. So, he pretty much said, fuck all that noise, and approached aerial combat in the same way that Indiana Jones approached sword fights. He preferred to avoid dogfighting where possible and instead stalk his prey from a distance, looking for larger, slower and isolated enemy aircraft while keeping the sun behind him so that they couldn't see him until it was too late. No, that's smart. Fucking camper. He would then swoop down on them from a high altitude and take them out with short bursts of machine gun fire from close range, aiming for the pilot's head with clinical precision. While he liked to play it safe, the Red Baron was still a formidable foe, and he had a few tricks up his sleeve for whenever an enemy got the drop on him. While flying at an enemy head on is generally a bad idea for obvious reasons, Whenever the Red Baron was ambushed, he preferred to charge in guns blazing over attempting to retreat. By doing this, he would take the initiative away from his enemy, who would then have to take evasive manoeuvres because the Red Baron was charging right at him, which would give the Red Baron the upper hand. Also, running away just gets you shot in the back instead yep. of the front. So... You might as well just not be a pussy about it, and if you die, you die like a man. However, there are exceptions to that rule. The Red Baron was very strict with making sure that his squadron knew when to quit. If the battle gets too long because the enemy is dodging too well, or you're just shit at your job, then just pull out. It's not worth getting stuck alone behind enemy lines with even more enemies to worry about, or just continuing to fuck up and embarrassing yourself. Work smart, not hard. However, mm. no matter how good you may be in the air, all it takes for everything to come crashing down is a single lucky shot. And, unfortunately, the Red Baron was no exception. On the 6th of July, 1917, a bullet grazed the Red Baron's head while he was in the air, which paralysed and blinded him. Unable to control his plane, he began to fall out of the sky. Uh -oh. But luckily, at the last second, he managed to regain his senses, just enough to recover from a spin and oh. manage a crash landing. Oh. However, that wasn't the end of his trouble. He needed multiple surgeries to remove all of these skull fragments from his brain, which mm. left him in very rough shape. But at least he managed to avoid meeting the other big man in the sky. Unfortunately, the injury never fully healed and it ultimately affected him for the rest of his life, although Damn. it did give him a pretty sick-looking four-inch scar that he once showed off at a restaurant by just slamming his head down on the table. I'm not sure why he did that. I don't think he knows either. I don't think they got all the skull fragments. From this point onwards, the Red Baron felt like shit whenever he flew, having to lie down after every mission to get over crippling nausea and headaches. But that wasn't the worst part. The Red Baron was different after getting shot in the head. 
He became mm. more distant in contrast with his previously high-spirited self. And his personality after the injury was described as more immature. Later that month, mm. the Red Baron went back in the air against doctor's orders. Just in time for the delivery of the iconic Fokker DR1 triplane, which the Red Baron flew for the rest of his career. But, sadly, after shooting down his 60th plane with his new toy, the Red Baron's luck really ran out. For every victory that the Red Baron had, he would get a silver cup made to commemorate it. But, after 60 victories, he never got another silver cup for his collection. Burgers or chicken? I say chicken. I like chicken. So what happened? Was he shot down? Did he crash? No, Berlin had run out of silver. <laughs> Berlin had run out of silver and there wasn't enough to make so many cups for the Red Baron. There was a war on. Unfortunately, the Red Baron didn't get very much time with his new plane. Because he hadn't fully recovered from his injury yet, he was put on leave from early September to late October. This time on the ground gave the Red Baron a lot of time to reflect, and he started writing some of the stuff he did down to pass the time. Uh -oh. That's right, he wrote an autobiography. He was only in his early 20s and he'd already done enough in that time to fill a book. The book titled Der Rot Kampfleiger, which roughly translates to the Red Fighter Pilot in English, was naturally used as propaganda by the German authorities. So at least he still managed to help the war effort somehow. Also, Despite how heavily they censored and edited it, the Red Baron's profile was so huge at this point that he was even receiving sack loads of fan mail. And he also had dinner with Kaiser Wilhelm himself. After the Red Baron's medical leave ended, his higher-ups were afraid that German morale would drop if anything happened to him. Because apparently he was such a hero that they wanted him to stop fighting. However, he refused to fly off into the sunset, so the German propaganda machine went into overdrive to capitalise on how much arse he was kicking. They made up rumours that there were British squadrons dedicated solely to bringing down the Red Baron, and that a Victoria Cross would be instantly awarded to anyone that succeeded. And a bullet wasn't the only thing that had gotten into the Red Baron's head because it's possible that even he might have half-believed his own hype. So for the rest of the year and beyond, the Red Baron continued to take advantage of his tactical genius and the fact that the British planes were shit to turn his enemies into impromptu fireworks displays. However the tide was beginning to turn. By 1918, the US had entered the war, and Germany knew that they would have to end the war quickly if they were to have any hope at victory. So, in March of 1918, the Ludendorff Offensive was carried out. The Germans poured pretty much everything they had into the Somme Valley in a bid to end the war, including the Flying Circus, who were sent in to support the final big push by intercepting British aircraft while protecting their own recon planes during the Battle of the Lys. But the British had also been busy. They had upgraded their planes and deployed the Sopwith Camel. However, while they helped a lot with evening the odds, they didn't stop the Red Baron. On 420, the Red Baron blazed two Sopwith camels with his machine guns, bringing Damn. his kill count up to 80. Around Damn. this time, the Red Baron's mother pressed Kaiser Wilhelm to pull her son away from the front, to which he agreed. So, on the 21st of April 1918, 
the Red Baron was two days from going on leave and embarked on his last day of flying. Mm. Just one more day and he was free. All he had mm. to do was get in the plane for one last time and then go home. Mm. What could possibly go wrong? No! Well, with a reunion with his mum just around the corner, the Red Baron was surrounded by family. His brother was kicking ass alongside him as always, and also his cousin, Wolfram, who had just joined him on his first flying mission. So, the Red Baron told the rookie to stay at high altitude and just watch and learn. You know, so that he didn't die. Unfortunately, there was a snag. The Red Baron and his eight squad mates had just engaged a five-strong Canadian squadron that also had a rookie with the exact same orders. A man named Wilfred May. Now, when it is your first day at a new job and you are told, stay out of the way, do not intervene, what do you do? Do you do your one job and stay out of the way? No. Or no. do you shoot at the Red Baron's fucking cousin? Oh. Well, like a fucking idiot, May picked the latter. And the obvious happened. The Red Baron noticed and went after the bastard that attacked his cousin. May immediately shit himself, as most pilots would do if they saw the Red Baron barreling towards them with malicious intent. And he tried his best to get the hell out of there, fleeing back behind friendly lines. Tell me he died. However, the Red Baron was not going to let him get away that easily. Yeah, you can't shoot and the fam. he gave chase, breaking his own golden rule. You can't shoot at the fam. He got to get that dead giveaway. Own golden rule. May's captain, Roy Brown, then noticed the Red Baron relentlessly chasing down May, and he pushed his plane as hard as he could as he raced to May's rescue. As the Red Baron chased May, the two planes got lower and lower, narrowly avoiding colliding with a church tower in the small town of Morlancourt. Then, after a couple of bursts of fire, the Red Baron's right machine gun jammed, and the two planes caught the attention of some Australian machine gunners on the ground, who set their sights on the Red Baron. However, despite the breathing room that this gave him for a moment, May was pretty much done for, as the Red Baron went for the kill with his left machine gun. But then, just in the nick of time, Roy Brown caught up with the Red Baron and unleashed a long burst of fire with his machine gun. However, the Red Baron was far enough away that he was sure that he was out of Brown's range. He was certain that he was safe. Shit. Until a 303 round tore through his chest. Mm. The Red Baron's plane jerked to the northeast and then it stalled as it went down. But Damn. he was just so good that not even literally dying stopped him from pulling off a rough landing in one piece. The what? Aussies on the ground immediately ran over to the plane, where they found the body of the 25-year-old Captain Manfred von Richthofen, Damn. who had been killed over a fucking scrub. But how terrified must that scrub have been? It was his first day in the air, and he had the Red Baron on his tail, trying to kill him. In the end, Captain Roy Brown was credited with shooting down the Red Baron, and got to enjoy all of the glory that came with bringing down the Royal Flying Corps' greatest enemy. But... Mm -hmm. But... Was he actually the one who killed him. It is very likely that Roy Brown didn't actually kill the Red Baron, and that it was actually just some random Australian Tommy on the ground with a machine gun. The glory was probably given to the Royal Flying Corps because it's pretty embarrassing if their greatest enemy was brought down by a sheer fluke, 
But that's tough shit because the evidence is not on their side. The bullet entered under the Red Baron's right shoulder and then exited next to his left nipple. Brown was shooting from a position behind, above, and most importantly, on the Red Baron's left. Hey, so, what's up, Harold, unless sister? there was a portal gun mounted to his plane, it's very unlikely that Brown actually killed the Red Baron. But regardless of who fired the fatal bullet, the Red Baron's erratic behaviour and target fixation are probably to blame for his demise. Neuropsychologists reckon that this might have been caused by post-concussive syndrome and PTSD resulting from his bullet to the head, which probably greatly impaired his judgement in high-stress situations because he couldn't process everything that was going on around him quickly enough. After the mm. dust had settled, the Red Baron's body was recovered and brought to a British hangar. The British reciprocated the Red Baron's respect for their fallen comrades by treating his body with great respect and, despite being enemies, airmen turned out in droves to pay their respects. One correspondent for a British magazine once said, anybody would have been proud to have killed Richthofen in action. But every member of the Royal Flying Corps would also have been proud to shake his hand had he fallen into captivity alive. The respect that the British had for their fallen foe was so great that they gave the Red Baron a funeral with full military honours on the 22nd of April. Damn. The following day, the Times reported, Captain Baron von Richthofen's funeral yesterday afternoon was a simple but impressive ceremony. The coffin, which was borne by six officers of the Royal Air Force, was deposited in ground in the corner of the French cemetery in a little village from ground near which, before the ceremony, one could look at Amiens Cathedral, standing in very clear and beautiful in the afternoon sun. The English service was read and yeah, the I am half, um... fired over the grave. Yeah, I am here. A wreath was also placed over the grave that read, To our gallant and worthy foe. As nice as this grave was, it was not the final resting place of the Red Baron, who was buried a total of four times. He was first reinterred in a French military cemetery for German dead, before being moved to a cemetery for German leaders and war heroes in Berlin following a state funeral in 1925. Unfortunately, this was on the Soviet side of the Berlin Wall during the Cold War, and the Nazis had erected a massive tombstone over his grave, which was shot at by escapees fleeing from East Germany. Due to this desecration, the Red Baron was finally moved to a family grave in Weisbaden, where he rests alongside his brother to this day. Damn. Press F, boys. Unfortunately, the Red Baron's plane was not treated with the same respect as his body. It was torn to shreds by Australian souvenir hunters almost as soon as it hit the ground. While there are patches of cloth from the aircraft dotted around in collections all over the world, the only parts of the plane that survived intact were the seat, which was donated to the Royal Canadian Military Institute by Roy Brown, and the machine guns and rotary engine, which are owned by the Imperial War Museum. Nevertheless, despite its dismantling, the iconic triplane lives on, not just in popular culture, but also in a more highly evolved form. What? They turned it into a DJ set? A Hammond organ. I don't even have a joke for that. That is just fucking amazing. And speaking of heavy metal, the Red Baron's Flying Circus was also the basis for the album cover of Led Zeppelin 2, and also a song by Iron Maiden in the Book of Souls. But to this day, the Red Baron is still a fixture of pop culture, tearing up the skies as he Freddy Krueger's Snoopy in his dreams, with 
80 confirmed kills and possibly over 100 in total, the Red Baron secured his place in the history books as the ace of aces of World War I, with more victories than any other pilot. His brightly coloured plane and persona also helped a lot with enshrining him in legend, despite the fact that most of the greatest aces of the war did not go out in a blaze of glory. Some did go out in a blaze of glory, usually in a pile of burning wreckage, because they tried to take on the Red Baron. Yo! That shit was fire. That was a really good story, yo.